I want to welcome you all to the Artist Outlook video series by the Appleton Museum of Art, College of Central Florida. I'm Patricia Tomlinson. I'm the curator at the Appleton, and we're just thrilled to have you all here tonight. Tonight is a very special person. We are excited to have him here. His painting, which we will talk about a little later, but his painting entitled Reaper is an absolute visitor favorite at the museum. So we're very excited to have Anthony Ackrell this evening. And I wanted to let him introduce himself in case some of you, I bet most of you are, but just in case some of you are not terribly familiar with him. Anthony, could you please introduce yourself to everyone and say a little bit about yourself, please? Hi, my name is Anthony Ackrell and I'm a painter. I've been painting for about 20 years or so. I went to the uh, Florence Academy of Art in Florence, Italy, and I studied there for five years. And I also taught for four of those years while I was there. And my, the background of the school is teaching a very, a very academic approach to painting, the type techniques that you would have learned if you wanted to be a painter anywhere in Europe prior to 20th century, 19th century, 18th, 17th, all the way back to the Renaissance era, the techniques and methods were very teachable, very traditional, um, based on a truth to nature of painting a image that looks believable in relation to nature, not necessarily super, super real, but everything was pretty much understandable and believable uh, in our portrayal even though there was various styles within that. But that was, that was the type of training that suited my temperament. And so I went there, came back to Gainesville in 2000 and have been living here and working in my studio and selling my work since then. Marvelous. Um, I think it's a really interesting story. Um, you mentioned it a little bit and I've also heard it around the museum how you got started in this very classic style. Can you tell everybody kind of how that happened? I think the story of that is fabulous. Oh, uh, well, it's, it's just the way I wanted to draw and paint when left to my own devices was um, like a lot of people, you, I, I had no background in art. I didn't grow up with any influences of art. Nobody in my family was an artist, never went to museums and I just, when left to my own devices to make a picture, I just tried to make it look like what it was. And I found um, in doing so that it was challenging to me that no matter what I wanted to depict, I had to figure out how to do it with each individual item. How do I make this orange look like an orange? How do I make this teacup look like a teacup, a tree like a tree? And I, was really struggling with it because I was doing it on my own. I, I didn't go to college, so I had no art background and I tried to go to University of Florida just to take art and I was chagrined to find out you have to start out as a freshman and take all kinds of courses that I had no interest in. I just wanted to learn how to paint. So one thing led to another to me searching out a teaching method that would teach you how to paint a series of, of um, guidelines that you could then apply to every single thing that you paint. You don't have to reinvent the wheel with every single subject that you want to paint. And I really gravitated towards figure paintings, uh, particularly believable imagery like from the Renaissance era and 17th, 18th, 19th century. It really appealed to my sensibilities for picture making. And I was so impressed by the um, the, the craftsmanship, the skill level that they possessed, that really uh, impressed me. Their uh, the technique was important as well as composition, design, theme, and everything else about a uh, picture. So through a series of happy coincidences in a long chain, I ended up learning of the Florence Academy of Art, actually by going to a lecture at the Appleton Museum on William Bouguereau, who is one of their uh, best paints, paintings in their collection. And the man who was giving the lecture there, I uh, asked him, how do you get that type of training that he would have gotten back then? And he said, go to Florence Academy of Art and study there. And so that put the chain in motion and I started. 
and um, turns out he was also associated with that school and was art historian himself, quite prominent. And he ended up being there when I was there. And uh, so it was a, a nice circle of events, but I never looked back. And once I got started in that training, it was very focused, very disciplined. Uh, you worked eight hours a day, five days a week, uh, 40 hours a week in the studio under constant supervision with instructors who were looking at your work and your subject and showing you what the difference was, how you did not have it right, how no matter how great you thought it was, you're wrong. And it's not about making a perfect image. It's about training your eye and hand to work together. The, I would say the main thing, the biggest thing I learned there was how to see, how to really, really see what I was looking at and break it down and analyze it. What makes that, what makes it look like that elbow is closer to me than the wrist on that body? How do you portray that on a two dimensional surface and make it look three dimensional? And it's, it's just a lot of things that it's very teachable. There's nothing vague or abstract or conceptual about it. And if somebody is showing you it, why you don't, why you didn't get it right, well, look, this is wrong this way. This is wrong that way. It was just very in, in, instructive to have somebody show you what is wrong with your work and what you are doing right and to explain things. And it really appealed to my sensibilities of having a, a construct, a sense of rules to follow. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. I, I, I work well in those, that parameter. So all the way around, it, it just really, it really worked for me. And the focus there was figure painting as a way of, um, th that was the big goal was to make a good figure painting. And it's, it's a means to an end. It wasn't that you should then go out and do nothing but figure paintings, but I became enamored of human form and human anatomy. I ended up teaching anatomy there. And I just became, that's all I wanted to do was paint figures. I just wanted to paint figures in landscapes. Um, and the, the gist of my work end, ended up is a lot of figure paintings, nude figures in sort of an idyllic setting in which there's no indication of a time period. I don't include contemporary items like cell phones and blue jeans and red plastic cups in litter. And I want, I want my work to be understandable to somebody 500 years from now. And I would like that if you took my painting back 500 years, everybody would understand it then as well. I don't want, I, I guess that's the definition of classic, <clears throat> or, um, but that's, that's what I do. And then along the way, I also make some other non-figure paintings, kind of wacky stuff, with giant bowling pin, seven feet tall on a big panel in a desert dusk sky. Um, I'm a little bit all over the place in that regard, but my biggest focus is um, figure paintings. And I, I think a well-painted figure by anybody is one of the, the finest achievements in, in art. Um, it's quite a challenge. There's nothing easy about it. And it takes a lot of training a long time and you have to be serious and disciplined and focused and have a fair bit of talent to start with um, to do it well. That's what I, I can tell you so far. I will, that's, that's wonderful. And I, it's makes us very proud that the Appleton played a little part in your story. We're very grateful for that. That's a Thank huge you. part. A huge part. Thank you. <laughs> I was looking at the Bougaro paintings, and yeah, one thing led to another. Well, and since you mentioned him, obviously Bougaro is a big, you know, a big piece of your work. But what other influences? Are there other painters that are influences to you? Let's talk a little bit about that. I'm real impressed with Renaissance era paintings like Caravaggio and Titian. Um, Anybody that was portraying a sense of drama or beauty and a good sense of form and in their work and contemporary painters, um, figure painter Odd Nerdrum, Norwegian uh, painter. I studied with him for a bit uh, after I went to Florence Academy of Art. Um, I, I'm, I'm impressed by, by form. I, I like uh, I, I like beauty in, in, in art and in imagery and drama and um, the Renaissance era to me really 
epitomize that. I mean, largely there was a lot of religious iconography in their work because that's what they were being, they were being, artists were being supported by the church and uh, the Vatican. So they had to paint religious themes, but even within those themes, they were pulling off some pretty interesting stuff. Um, yeah, pick a Renaissance artist and I'd say, yes, I was influenced by them and I don't try to emulate them, um, but the type, they learned, the way I learned to paint was the same techniques that they did. So there's gonna be similarities in how my paintings look, but I'm not trying to make an antique looking painting. Uh, it's just that whatever sensibilities they had for how to make a picture are mine as well. They were either born too early or I was born too late. I don't know which. Oh, I think I think it's a lovely continuation. I think you were born at the exact time you should have been. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. My mom thinks so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, let's maybe take a peek at some of your artwork. Now, I did want to mention everyone just for full disclosure, um, as Anthony mentioned, he does paint nudes. So there are these paintings will contain a great deal of nudity in the imagery that we're about to see. So I just wanted you all to know. So let me get this up on the screen. Okay. <clears throat> Just one second, there we go. Okay, so Anthony, I did put these, we had talked about this a bit, I did put these somewhat in uh, from earliest going to latest, but I just thought you could, you know, kind of discuss a little bit, and of course I'll ask you some questions too, sort of about the continuation, because we had a really kind of interesting discussion about that the other day, um, off camera, so to speak, and um, I think it would be interesting to touch on some of that too. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about Funeral for a Dream. One of the things I think that is really interesting about your art, and I would like to know this from you, and I think a lot of our viewers might as well, there's, there's a whole lot of sort of myth, to, to my mind, myth and legend. And I don't know if they're myths and legends that you've come up with, or if they're really patterned on it actual myths and legends that that we all have studied and know about. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, in regard to this painting, um, it's more of a universal, I guess, contemporary idea of when you're actually this specifically is about a, a loss, a, a loss of a partner of a mate of a lover. And in that, um, if you're really struggling with that, one thing that I read that you can do is take all the mementos that you have from that relationship, all the little notes, all the this, all the that, the theater tickets and your wedding ring, whatever it was, put it in a little box or whatever and actually have a funeral for it. Actually bury it, make it a ceremonial thing to try and put it to rest. And that's what this, this is depicting here. Okay, okay, that's really interesting. Um, and then, of course, we want to talk about, you know, you do have that moody, Caravaggio-esque <laughs> lighting, you know, a little bit of chiaroscuro going on in there. And I think we're going to see more of that as we keep going. Now, one of the things that's all, also very interesting to me about some of your works is you've got a whole lot of sky in this image. You didn't, you know, 50-50 it, you, you, what did you do, 70-30 it? <laughs> so why, I guess part of what I think people will find interesting is how you come up with some of the compositional elements that you do. Can you talk a little bit about you know, your decision to use so much sky and the beautiful um, sunset, which of course I'm sure, I'm sure is allegorical here. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, um, in this picture, I want him to have room to breathe. I want him to have space. And yes, the sun going down is uh, directly connected to the, the ending of something. And it's, all, it's my favorite time of day is dusk. In, in most of my paintings, it looks like it's about seven o'clock on a summer evening. Um, it, it might look like dawn or dusk. It's, in my mind, it's always dusk. And in this picture, yes, it's relevant to demise, 
but um, a, a lot of it's just visual. How much, how much space does he need? If he made less, he might feel cramped. If you give him more, then he gets uh, minimized. A lot of it's just feel for graphic design. I have a background in graphic design that I employ a lot in placing things within uh, the picture square. Um, yeah, it's just a lot of it is just a feel for what feels right. Okay, fair enough. So let's move on to the next one. This one is also very intriguing. And another thing that I have at least noticed in your work is there's a lot of psychology going on. Could you talk about that a little bit as well? Um, not really. Um, because I, the, the part of my brain that decides what I want to paint is not really wired directly to my mouth. I don't know. I don't know one thing led to another to this image. I really can't tell you what the process was that led to this other than I wanted to paint that shell. And one thing led to another, to another, to another. And unfortunately, the, the actual steps get lost in the shuffle. The paintings take a long time to make and they evolve over time. And very often when I'm done with a painting, I look at it and I'm seeing it for the first time in the same way that everybody else is seeing it. And I look at it and I decide, well, what's that about? And I have to figure it out and come up with a title. I, I'm not usually starting out with a concept and saying, how can I portray this concept? I'm usually starting out with a visual image or an idea and usually with a figure. And in this one, there's a lot of repeating forms, patterns um, and motion. And uh, I, I like a lot of sky. I like, I love painting the sky. And most of my paintings feature um, late afternoon light, water and um, a lot of sky. Um, yeah, I, I know I don't have a great answer for that question and I'm, I feel like I'm supposed to, but I'm not saying I'm a channeler, but the, the, the paintings come to me bit by bit and form themselves in a way and they often change in the process um, based on what I already put on, on canvas. It's very few paintings that I start out with with a concept to portray and stick with it all the way through. See, that's really fascinating. I would not have seen your art and becoming so familiar with it. I, I did, wouldn't, I would ne wouldn't necessarily have guessed that. I find that's really interesting. So let's go to the next one. This one is also, I've got my own narrative <laughs> of what's going on here. <laughs> but, um, I, and I love some of your titles because I mentioned this to you once too. I think it is extremely interesting that you've got, you know, a nude young woman holding a skull with her fingers actually in the eye, eye sockets and it's entitled Picnic. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really, that, that to me just opens a hundred more questions. Could you talk about kind of the marriage of the artwork and the title as well? Um, in this one, I would say, it is, I, I do like contrast. I do like juxtaposing things that don't seem to go together, whether it be a, uh, a texture, uh, like I, I might paint a, uh, a still life that shows a, a tomato in a vice being slowly crushed or soft and hard. Um, um, and in this case, it would be youthful beauty and a woman who represents a life-giving entity and death obviously in her hand yet she's she's delighted you know she's very pleased with who she is and where she is and even though she's embracing death with her hand um and again with this one i had i have to come up with a title some paintings i would rather not title but i i have to for gallery purposes and i she looked like she's on a picnic i mean like she could be carrying a little basket in her hand so I, I just like the irony of that title and the look on her face that she is so, um, it, it's no problem to her that she's that close to death. She's young and beautiful and healthy and has everything in the world for her. So no, I mean, yeah, there, there's no real story to me other than a combination, the irony of combining all of those 
elements in a picture. And then of course the, the, the sky and the, and the sea also, you know, timeless elements of, of life, water and uh, air. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's move on to the next one. Now, another thing I wanted to talk to you about, um, you had mentioned to me, and I think a lot of people will find this interesting. You sort of just touched on it in the very beginning. Um, you use live, real human beings when you create your imagery, yes? Always. I never paint a figure without a model. And the figure is painted almost entirely head to toe uh, side to side, front to back, copying what I see, more or less. I might I might change some things on some people a little bit, but I work exclusively from life. And um, in some cases, I've actually had to mix and match body parts, put somebody else's head on another person's body just for aesthetic reasons um, and design. Um, but yes, I always work from life. The process is far more engaging to me to have a real live person there. It's much more daunting. Uh, copying from a photograph is quite tedious and not very interesting to me. Engaging in the real process with a real person and they're there in front of me and I know them and we work together for many, many hours over time. It's that dynamic um, connection that I have with them in creating this painting rather than just about me sitting there and making stuff up and portraying it. Um, yeah, so everybody in this is somebody very real. So let, that brings me to another question regarding that. Um, are these, how do, you, how do you get your models? Are they, are they friends? Are you, you know, hitting up the guy at the local grocery store? <laughs> how are you getting your models? I've, uh, Pre-internet, um, yes. I used to occasionally ask uh, a person in, uh, that was the hardest thing to do is ask a stranger. And most people said yes. And, uh, but by and large, I started out by just placing an ad in the college paper for an artist model for paintings. And um, well, I was surprised how many people apply, young people. And once I got started, just word of mouth, one thing led to another to another, and I really didn't have to advertise anymore. Um, yeah, so it's, it's been happenstance. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Another thing that I've noticed in your work as, it, as it's progressed through time, and I, I don't, you may shoot me down on this, but this, from what I've seen, this seems to be the case. You have gone, you, how to explain? Your, your forms have become entangled. It, some of your earlier work, it was, you know, the heroic male nude, the heroic female nude. And now, now through time, it seems like you're having them interact and entangle and you, you seem to really delight in the complexity of where, you know, where does this limb go and where does that leg go? And, you know, and, and I think that's really interesting. Do you feel that, did you see, are you seeing what I'm seeing or am I off on that? I, I do. I never really thought about it, but yes, I like, I like design. I like the entanglement in this picture in particular and the interlocking forms, like putting two pretzels together. Um, and yes, I, I just wanted to have more elements than just the single figure in there. Just it, it doubles the psychological impact of what you're looking at. And it, it doubles how much you can portray. The most I've ever painted, I think, was four people. Well, three people and a mermaid in one in one painting. Um, I I like, yeah, I, I like the more the merrier. But I have a limit for how many people I can um, get squeeze into a box and and s still make it all work. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, and then oh, and another thing I wanted to mention too is um, one of the things I. I really appreciate about your art, and I, I'm probably not alone in this, is your female forms in a lot of, not all your paintings, but a lot of your paintings, your female forms are Rubenesque. They are curvy. They, are, they look like real women. And I, I really appreciate that because especially, you know, you see so many 
extremely thin people in advertising and and movie stars and pop stars and you know it's nice to see people especially with these two they look like real human beings that you might see when you're out taking a walk uh that's because they are these are two real women uh and yeah i think i think curves look look good on a woman uh, as opposed to to angles i i have a i guess a very stereotypical traditional view. I, I like, if I'm painting a man, I like it to be angular. And if I'm painting a woman, I like there to be uh, as many curves as possible. I, and especially um, if you can mix and match those two. This painting actually, one woman posed for both bodies, the woman who is with her eyes closed. She is both figures, but I couldn't put her head on two figures. So the head leaning against the tree is a, a, a separate woman. And again, here it is, it's dusk, and there's a little patch of water down at the bottom. There's um, some mushrooms, because I can't name names for these ladies liked mushrooms. <laughs> I often put some little personal thing in there for the model themselves, and they were very close. Um, they knew each other, and um, yes, there's not a whole lot happening here to me other than what the title Im implies, kindred, not like in blood relatives, but just kindred spirits. The things that they value are similar and a similar, um, I don't know what, kindred or kindred. Kindred spirits. <laughs> I always like trees. I always put a lot of, it, always want a, a tree somewhere in my painting. Uh, so there's lots of trees. The, the, com the common themes are trees, water, sky, and figures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and that goes right back to that bucolic setting that was so common you know, historically in art. I mean, you you would set your goddesses and your heroes in these beautiful, you know, mythical gardens and whatnot. So for me, you're just, you're continuing that wonderful tradition. Well, as I said earlier, I, I, I the biggest focus, I, I want to make an image that is beautiful. I feel like there's ample opportunities to look at ugliness in the world around us and it's all created by humans. I think if you roamed the entire planet before a human was on it, you would not find one thing disagreeable to look at. So there's plenty of ugliness out there. I feel I would be remiss to go around creating something that's not attractive when I have the ability to make something that is beautiful. And I just mean visually beautiful to look at or maybe how it feels or how it makes you feel. I don't think anybody typically feels bad looking <laughs> looking at my paintings, I hope not. Um, Again, it's 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 not a very lofty approach to painting what I make. I I like painting things. I like painting scenes that I would that I find appealing to look at, or that if I was there, I'd say, "Oh, that's nice. That's pretty almost childlike." Well, that's fair enough. Um, the next one we have here is title. So we're moving through time now to 2012, and one and I noticed this through time with your with your paintings as well. And once again, correct me if I'm off on this. But there, there is, a, um, how to put this, uh, I don't want to say eroticism, but there is a, is a playful, loving manner that I see. You see it in Kindred, you see it with these two ladies, you know, they're, they're clearly very united. Um, yes, I, I'm aware that there is some sense of sensuality within the figures, just they being nude in the first place. Um, I'm very careful to not make any kind of overt eroticism in it that changes the nature of my work in general. And I'm not opposed to it. It's just that for what I'm doing, and frankly, for trying to sell paintings, that's a, a more limited market. Um, so yes, it's sometimes a little more overt, like in, in this one, I guess. Um, but it also, it, 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 to me, always feels rather innocent at, this, at the same time. Um, nothing threatening about it or, or offensive, at least not to me in it. And I, I agree entirely. And I did wonder, um, because you really, in this particular piece, I mean, maybe you have more mermaids that I have not seen, but in this one, it does seem like a departure because you've got obviously, you know, two-legged, human beings. And then we have a mermaid. And it did make me wonder if this might have even been a commission or something like that, because it, it's different. It's very different from the other works of yours that I've seen. 
Um, I'm, I'm, I like mermaids. <laughs> I'm intrigued by them. Uh, it's not a very masculine trait, but yeah, I think there's something um, very beguiling about them. And um, I, I don't have a, a, a real big answer for that, for that question. Um, I painted more than, I've made more than one painting of mermaids, probably three now. Okay. And I'll, I'll probably do more. I also like fish and, and water and I, I like, uh, I like painting women. So, oh, look, you can put them all together. Fish, water, woman, uh, get it all in one picture. Well, perfect. Well, I'm a Pisces, so I'm all, I'm I'm all completely okay with the mermaids and the fish. Yeah. Well, I think that's, great. that's part of it. <laughs> um, so now you had mentioned earlier the giant bowling pin. So now we're in 2018 time wise with your works. I also obviously find this a pretty big departure. What made you start? I mean, had you been doing this all along or did you suddenly go, I want to start painting objects for a bit in, in addition to people? How did, the, how did this evolve? I've done it concurrently, even starting when I was in school, because in school, the training, even though I said the focus of it, the epitome of, of it was to get to figure painting. That was the end goal. But in that process, you paint a lot of still life paintings, a lot of cast paintings, plaster casts, a lot of objects. And I painted the, the, the traditional bowl of fruit and the flowers and the bottle of wine and that sort of thing. And I, I like doing it to learn, but it, I just wanted it to be a little more interesting to me. So I started painting more unusual still life paintings. And one thing led to another, then I painted a bowling pin in one and um, I think I like bowling pins. I don't know why. Well, partly I do know why, because it's, it's a very feminine, voluptuous figure. Uh, it's reminiscent of the, the type of women that I, I seem to paint a lot. And um, I, I like painting small things large. I like making large paintings of little things. That's, that's very intriguing to me. I, I love, if I had room for it, I'd carry a magnifying glass with me everywhere. I like, I like looking at little things up close. I like I, and again, this one is, I like the sense of scale. I like the, the uh, incongruity of it being something that is only in anybody's life experience inside a noisy building with, uh, you know, playing a game. And here it seems to be an iconic image out in what maybe some sort of bleak desert landscape. Uh, there's little stars in the sky. You can't maybe see it on this painting. So it's titled Stars Fell on Lane 7. Um, no, there's, there's no big story behind this other than I, I, I like bowling pins. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, but I, but the way you've lit it, once again, it's, it's like the heroic figure in bowling pin form. I mean, you've still kept those elements of lighting and that classicism as if it were a human, but quite obviously it's not. So I, I find that really intriguing too. Well, that, yeah, that's a good point. It, it does have a, a, a heroic uh, stance to it. Yes, it's, it's very bold. Um, it looked, even though it's a bowling pin, you would think you couldn't knock it over. It looks like it's it's 30 feet tall. Um, yeah, that's a good point. How tall is this painting? How large is it? It's uh, seven feet tall. Oh my goodness. It's painted on, it's actually, it's painted on a wooden door panel, the type that you would have on a, like a, you know, with, with, that you could buy with that doesn't have any holes cut into it yet. So I put gesso on the wood and uh, started painting. So it's quite large. That's the, so it truly is the heroic bowling pin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's another um, inanimate object. And I, I, I do, I really like this painting because I think you picked the perfect fruit or vegetable, depending on how one looks at a tomato. I know that's an ongoing conversation. <laughs> But for example, if you had put, this is going to sound odd, but if you had put lemons on that, I think it would look, it wouldn't have been as successful. If you had put a cucumber on that, I, I, I think with the dark, cold, metallic sheen of that anvil, that the tomato was basically the perfect thing to pick. Did you experiment with other things on that anvil or was it like tomato? No, uh, this is an unfortunate recurring theme. And I say unfortunate because 
I, I paint I paint a lot of tomatoes and the starting when I was in school, I lived in Italy and the tomatoes in the market that you'd see every day, they were just ungodly, beautiful, just bursting red um, little things. And so I painted a lot of them. Uh, I would put them in my paintings, but again, I just enjoyed the portraying the contrast of their delicacy with something not delicate. And um, yes, I did the first one I did, I put the tomato in a vise. Um, and it was slow, you could see it being squeezed. And I like that tension because you know, you turn the, the handle on the vice one more notch and you're gonna have a mess. And the, the same implication is here. Uh, okay, an anvil with the, the heavy hammer. Well, of course you hit whatever's on the anvil, uh, a lemon or a cucumber, this would be more dramatic to hit a tomato. It's much more fragile. There's much more tension, drama etc. And also, I guess there's the, chen the tension of the one hanging over the edge. When is it going to fall? It's like a, I don't know, a, a rock climber or, a, you know, somebody hanging over the edge. So there's that. And then the one on the far right, the tomato, um, they call it tension, you know, it, it could roll off, you know, drama and look how the anvil is hanging over the front edge. Well, that anvil is not going to just fall off, but you'll see that very common in a still life painting. Uh, a knife blade hanging over the front edge. It's supposed to be tension, like, ooh, it could fall. So I do those things, but also just in, incorporate a sense of space and to give that board bench that is on a sense of three-dimensionalness. You can see it cast a shadow over the front. And then I painted it on a, a very old board that's actually an antique uh, drawing table, drafting table top. It's probably 20 by 30 inches or so. And I liked add introducing that element, the coarseness of it, the crudeness of it, um, kept it was in keeping with the the anvil and the uh, the hammer. And the nail on the right side is just there for composition, just a little blip. But yeah, I like painting tomatoes. They're 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 fun and they're they're also sensuous and and curvy and they're they're luscious. And when you put them with things that are the opposite, I just find it interesting. I agree. And I, your texture on this is just absolutely dynamite. The first time I saw this, I think I literally went, oh, <laughs> it's just the you were playing with texture and it's just so fun. It's a great piece. Well, the lighting on here is the same as in some of my paintings, chiaroscuro, light and dark. I, I, I'm a sucker for form. I like to depict voluminous, volume. I like being able to show that the shape and size and dimension of an object and it's almost just a cheap trick to put it emerging from darkness because the, the way the light falls on it creates dramatic sh shadows, which really describes the form. You know, if this was frontally lit from straight on, the, the, the image would be the same, but there would be less drama. This is a dramatic stage setting to it. It's like a little tableau. And I often do that with these sort of uh, images is to create a dynamic, sense of, of a stage of an event of what's happening. Even if it's something serene like funeral for a dream, it still puts us literal spotlight. Uh, although I always work from natural light, this is from a skylight directly above. Um, yeah, I work with, I'm very, very sensitive to the lighting. It, there's no accident of the portrayal of light in, in my images. I work a lot with getting it just right. Okay. And then it's interesting you use natural light too. I, I don't think I, we had talked about that previously. So that's another interesting thing. I work exclusively by natural light and exclusively from life with models. Um, and it's very challenging because the lighting changes, particularly in Florida. Um, if a cloud goes by, then the lighting falls off dramatically and then it's back a few minutes later. But it's just, it just creates a far more believable image to me. And Again, the, the best paintings I've ever seen, every single one of them in all my life, they were all painted working from life and working with natural light by and large. I mean, sometimes they use candlelight and torches back in the day, but there's just, it just imbues your image with a believable nature to it if you work with natural light and real objects. And again, copying from photographs, it's, it's so simple. You just copy it. The camera's already done the hard part of um, reducing a three-dimensional scene to two dimensions. 
Now you just copy that two-dimensional image, the photo onto your canvas. You don't have to figure out how to make it look three-dimensional again. Um, so I, yes, I, I like working from life exclusively. And often, even with a model, you know, they change, the position changes there and you can walk around it three, three dimensionally to get a better understanding of what you're looking at. So um, if it, the things that I, that are not painted from life are the backgrounds and all the figure paintings, I'm making all those up, the trees, the sky, the water. I'll, I'll go outside and paint some landscape studies of trees and skies and, and water, just so I have a better understanding of how to portray them. But they are all painted based on how the model was painted. I first, in those figure paintings, first the model is painted from life in the studio with natural light. And then I use the colors scheme that was painted to make that model. I only use those colors to then fabricate a background. I can't go out and, and paint a landscape that's going to fit what I want in my painting because the model will end up looking like she's cut out and stuck on there. So you have to create a background that looks like the same environmental lighting as what your subject is painted with. And I do that by just not deviating from the colors. Different recipe, different proportions of those same five or six, seven colors that I used to paint a figure. So it's a little bit limiting, but I feel it gives you more harmony in a painting to not have a whole bunch of different pigments in it. It's better to make your own combinations um, with a limited palette than just having 20 tubes of different colors of paint, I think. There's a time and place for it and plenty of people do that and it looks great, but I, I like to keep it simple. Okay. So let's talk about your work in progress. Um, we'll all show the title later at the last slide, but I thought people would really be interested. I mean, you've given a really good overview of your process, but this is like, you know, really getting to see what you do. Um, if I can, you know, as you're talking, I can just cycle through them. So do you want to kind of talk everybody through how you make your paintings? I first start out with a pencil drawing, a small one, like eight and a half by 10 inches and make a compositional sketch. And then I use the model to get her to pose like what I came up with in the compositional sketch. And once I get that pose nailed down, then I make a color sketch, a miniature little painting, uh, eight by 10, just making it up of what it's going to look like. Then I make that charcoal drawing, which was the first one that we just looked at. Oops, and that, <laughs> that, yeah, that is, that is large, larger. It's like, that's the size of the, the finished image on the painting and that's drawn from life. And um, I, I tried to resolve all the drawing issues at this stage in black and white with line with charcoal because it's, it's so much easier just to get your drawing correct. That's one of the things that was a big focus at the school was drawing, 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 get your drawing right. And don't try and combine figuring out your drawing while you're trying to figure out color value, et cetera, get your drawing right. So when I am ready to put the figure on canvas, it's like this, it's like a coloring book. Ideally, the drawing is correct when I transfer it to canvas and I just have to now literally color it like a coloring book but you can see the outline of where her legs used to be. I get stuff wrong so much, so much all the time. I'm not a strong draftsman. It takes me a long time to get the drawing correct. So I really try and, and nail it down in this stage when it's a simpler process than have to move a well-painted hand that happens to be too big, um, you know, way down the road. I try and get it right. But even in this drawing, I thought it was right, but it turns out it wasn't. I made changes later in the painting, as you'll see. Okay, so then we go to this part. Yeah, they look really bad. They, my paintings look really awful for a long time before they get better. And it's discouraging, it's alarming. And almost every painting I make, I go through a process of thinking, I'm not gonna get it. I, I can't do this, I'm terrible. What was I thinking? And I just have to plow ahead with it and get it right. I mean, look at her face, it's, it looks like, I don't know what, it's, it's awful. It's hard for me to even look at this. I forgot about how bad this was. But fortunately, this all gets painted over. So that blue, that I put a blue tone on the canvas thinking, because her skin was very pale, the model, um, thinking that some of that cool tone would help if it could show through. But 
I paint over things so much that those tones never end up really making a difference. But, and, and that's what happened with this one. So I just start out with getting the figure on the canvas and defining the drawing with light and dark and then move on to there. And yeah, there's, this is just a train wreck. Um, her, her head and shoulder and her little claw down there. <laughs> so let's, let's move on if it's painful. <laughs> so now we're getting, we're getting some color. <laughs> Yeah, this is not a whole lot better, but uh, yes, this is the, the first day, two days of blocking in what you would call the local color. What is the general color tones that you see in those areas? And obviously there's no background whatsoever. I'm just working exclusively to get her, the general lighting scheme on her correct. Um, and I put that darker tone all around her because in the studio, that was the approximate color and value of what was behind her. So it's important for me when I'm looking at a subject to paint that the elements that are visually touching that subject, the background, that they are the same as what I'm painting. You know, if she had a red fabric behind her and I'm trying to paint a green forest behind her in my painting, it's gonna be very jarring. So I just indicate a rough background of what I actually see in the studio and then create the landscape later around that. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, go the, ahead. Again, here, I mean, her head is just a disaster. I really struggled with it on this painting. Shall I move, shall I move forward? Yes, please, quickly. Okay. <laughs> so, see, now her face is looking good. <laughs> yes, it is. It, it's much better, and her body, her legs are much better, um, but her head's in the wrong place. Look how far shifted over off the center line of her body it is uh, on her hand. And there, I don't know how it got that way. I don't know. <laughs> it just did. And I ended up having to, to, to move it. I couldn't, it just looked wrong. It looked like her head was coming off, not the center of her body. So yeah, it was getting well painted. It was starting to look like her, but nope, I had to redo it. And that's hard to do because you put a lot of effort into something like the intricacies of a face and it's too big, it's too small, it's, it's just wrong. And I try and convince myself a hundred ways and ask a hundred people, does this look right? How is it, how is it? And ultimately, if it's wrong, you have to move it because it's, it has to, for me, the drawing has to be correct or it's just gonna fall apart. Okay, so let's move on to the further, getting a little more there. Yes, here I've started to indicate the background, the uh, water in the foreground. Anthony, you just froze. Ooh. Anthony, is everything okay? Your image just froze and we can't hear you. Oh dear. Gigi, do you know what it could be? Anthony, you it could froze. Be it could be his area because he was on service. So I have to walk in and walk back out. Okay, back I'm, I'm, our apologies, everyone. We seem to have some technical difficulties. It looks like he did log out, so we'll we'll get him up. Let's stay with this lovely lady, and we'll try to get him back in. Look at his split, Jonah. If you could watch the um, the um, him coming in, I can't get to it where I am. Okay. So everyone, I just, um, I'll just talk. <laughs> um, I, I hope you all are enjoying this. And I, I think, I felt that this was really fascinating to, to see how he does it step by step. And you're really kind of getting into the mind of the artist himself. Obviously he's a very intelligent person. He thinks very deeply about what he's doing and about his process, even though he may go into this without an idea of exactly how he wants it to look. Um, I think it's pretty obvious how he is extremely contemplative about his artwork. So I think that's a large part of what makes him him and makes him so good because it's, it's very carefully crafted. He's paying very close attention to what he does. Uh, doesn't, is he bad? Let's see if he's back in yet. I see that he's back in, but you gotta okay. unmute him. Marvelous. Anthony, are you there? Yes. Oh, terrific. Okay, so I kept the slide up for you, so take it away. <laughs> uh, yes, in, in that, video, that, that picture, 
yes, I think I pretty much covered it. Uh, this woman had incredibly long voluminous hair and you can see that being indicated there. This painting started out that she was going to be lying down and resting on this rock with a little trickling waterfall and her hand was supposed to be just dangling in the water. And I just wanted it to be a little bit more than some kind of mindless depiction of an idol, I-D-Y-L. Um, and that led for one thing to another to make some, some changes in this. Um, that I guess you'll see in the upcoming. Okay, so let's go to the next. So here we go more. Yes, so now there's a whole lot more background. I'm sorry this picture was photographed at an angle. It had to be to get compensate for glare on it. Uh, and the perspective is a little skewed. So now I've changed the position of her head uh, yet again entirely and decided to include a serpent in here that she's engaging with. And the background, uh, you can't see it really well, but there's some waterfall off to the left, the tree mass above her, distant landscape, the usual sky, etc. cetera. Um, and I wanted this serpent to be a fantastical one. Um, I didn't want it to be a one that somebody could say, oh, that's an anaconda, that's a boa, whatever. I wanted there to be an element of fantasy in this. And I wanted her to be completely um, not intimidated, even though she's embracing something that typically represents danger or in some cases death. No problem for her. It's somewhat like a picnic with the woman was very nonplussed about her close connection with the symbol of death. So okay. yeah, this is now changing. And uh, fortunately, I was able to just leave her hand in the same place and just stick this snake in there. Okay, so let's go on to where we are. It, is the, and how, how current is this? Is this literally how it looks right now? Or have you been um, doing some more since? Some little more things. I've added some goldfish in the water down in the bottom left. Um, work at her, her forehead probably needs to be a little bit taller, maybe a little more hair on top of her head. Uh, some little detailed things like that. Uh, I put a bunch more little plants and things in the far bottom right to sort of mimic the, the flower mass that's behind her legs. But yes, yeah, so you can see there's been a lot of, a considerable amount of elements added. And um, again, there's, there's nothing that I haven't already put in all my other paintings. It's just a different arrangement of them. To, to me, this painting is almost um, a metaphor for Florida the, or the goddess, you know, Florada. Um, you've got, you know, the magnolia, very southern. You've got the waiting, you know, the long waiting bird, egret, what heron, what have you. You know, I, to me, this is an extremely Florida painting. Except for the mountains. Well, yeah, but we're just, but that's all, those are offshore. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the imagery too, in some of yours, I saw, I kind of thought this a little bit in also um, your, um, is it, I'm, forgive me, is, was it Twilight at Crying Rock? Dusk. Dusk at Crying Rock. And right. this one, the, I may be reading into it, so correct me once again if I'm wrong on this one, but I do see elements of what to me appear to be perhaps a little bit of religious imagery. I mean, because obviously even the snake, I mean, that that's a no brainer, but it you do, to me, it seems like there is a little bit of that creeping in. Is that just my take on it? No, I'm sure there is. I was raised Catholic, went to 12 years of Catholic school. So it was very much a part of my upbringing. And in my studies in Florence, again, I was looking at a lot of religious paintings and I actually learned a whole lot more about Christianity and Catholicism through art history and the themes portrayed there than I actually remembered from my upbringing. So yes, I'm sure it's there. It's not intentional. And I know that this, you cannot look at this and not think of Eve, but to me, that's not what it's about. Um, so yes, I, I understand. I mean, I painting of a woman crucified on a cross. And to me, it's no connection to Jesus. There's a whole different story about that image. But I understand, yes, there is, there are elements of religious iconography in my work, but uh, it's not real intentional. Okay. 
Okay. And then last but certainly not least is the Appleton's own Reaper. Well, one of our most fan favorite and beloved paintings. Um, and this again is a real person. And I've heard a lot of different stories about this. So I actually want you to tell the story, please, Anthony. Tell us about this wonderful painting. This I made um, the first year after I got out of school. So I finished school in 2000 and um, I hired him again out of a newspaper ad. And I wanted to make um, a depiction of Icarus. I'm fascinated by that myth and I like flight and wings. And that story has always fascinated me. So that was my idea. And he showed up, answered my ad, and he, I, I didn't want to make him Icarus. He was far more impressive that I felt like I needed to make something that was more about him. He was like six feet two or three and this 19 year old handsome fit young man, very dynamic person. And somehow I just felt more that he belonged in his own, in his own image, in his own uh, setting, rather than using him to portray an existing story. And he was not a farm boy. He was not a country boy. He was a very much a city boy from Jacksonville that was going to UF at the time. And um, he's kind of a rough and tumble guy, actually. And um, yes, I. I think that again, this was something that the pose came before the image did. And I have this, this big side that he has there. I just thought, okay, well, how can we use this as a prop? And first I had him standing with it with the blade up, like the way the Grim Reaper does. And then it felt like, oh, well, that's like the Grim Reaper. You can't escape that. And I didn't want to portray that. But again, one thing led to another in just posing him, what made him look best in the lighting, in my studio that showed off him and his body and his physique. And this is what it, it led to. And once that was determined, um, I the background, it just, because he's got this side, well, I'm not gonna put him in a shopping mall. I'm gonna put him in a place more appropriate. And this is one of the few paintings that I've painted depicting a human in contemporary times because of his clothing, um, the fabric. But um, yeah, the side, sure, you could have that 500 years ago. But um, um, yeah, so I, that's how that came about. Okay, well, we, we sure love it. And we're grateful to um, the, Flor the Endowed Acquisition Fund for Florida Artists that we were able to get this piece. So I'm gonna take it off of Stop Share. We will be going over an hour. We've had such a lovely discussion and it looks like we have a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> so um, let me, or comments. So let me look at some of these. Um, let's see. How long does Rick writes, how long does a typical painting take you to complete, Anthony? Okay, that one that we just looked at, Reaper, that was probably 60, 70 hours. I worked with the model probably 40 or 50 hours. And we work in increments of like two, three hours a day, several days a week. You have to wait for the paint to dry between applications. So even though it, it might take 50 hours of working with the model, it doesn't mean you can do it in, in that quickly. They, they take months. As far as calendar time, they take months. Actual hour time average with a figure and a landscape, 50, 60, 70 hours total, I guess. Okay. That's the complexity um, of the model too. And, and are, do they have all their hands and feet and faces visible? That's the stuff that slows you down. Okay. Peter writes, um, how much drawing do you do for one painting? And I think this Peter may be a relative of yours. He's got the same last name. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> Um, I make, I make a, um, pencil sketch to, to, to come up with the composition and, um, then I make studies for the model and actually not a lot is one of the reasons I'm not a great draftsman. I don't draw a lot. I pretty much draw only in order to make the picture. You'll never see me out just wandering around with a sketchbook the way a lot of artists do. And it's, it's one of my shortcomings. But um, I don't do a lot of drawing. I'm just focused on getting the, the figure right 
uh, so that when it gets into the canvas, that there's fewer problems to have to wrestle with. Okay. Jim asks, where did you start painting Man Racing a Snail? Where? Yes, where? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, in my studio in Gainesville? Yes. Um, I don't know. Sure. I guess maybe, maybe he's getting at, did you have a particular locale in mind or something when you... Oh, in the painting? Um, no, it's just a, a generic seascape. I think, I can't see the picture now, but I think there's rocks in the background just for compositional element. Uh, I know that the person who bought it uh, lives in Hawaii, so it might be appropriate there. It worked out nicely. Um, a lot of my scenes, again, they're, it's always warm. You'll never see anybody cold in any of my paintings. And I want, I, I, I like warmth. I don't want to, I don't want any frigidness in my, my pictures. Everything is warm and sunny and golden. And, and like that one too, the water's, to me, the water is obviously warm wherever he is. Lovely. <laughs> Sounds nice. <laughs> <laughs> Rick also has a question. He wanted, he asks, do you have a preference for painting female nudes or male nudes? And in your mind, is there a difference? Um, I think males are a little easier, again, because of the angular nature of them. You can get it wrong and it'll still look good um, to me. And I just work, it's just easier to work with more angular features. Um, I don't have a preference. I like painting both. Uh, practical level, uh, male nudes are harder to sell, sell. So if I had to choose for financial reasons, it's more financially viable to paint a woman uh, and more socially acceptable. I mean, that's why they're easier to sell. So um, no, I don't have a preference. I, I seem to have almost an equal amount of both in the body of my work. Okay. Suzanne asks, do you start, you kind of answered this, but maybe she wants a little more clarification. She asks, do you start with the nude in an interesting position and then put it in the setting or do you start with an overall concept? I start with the overall concept with the, the small pencil sketch and then a little uh, color sketch to, to see um, make a map visually of where I'm going. And then yes, the, the figure gets painted and the, the landscape built around the figure on the canvas, but it's based on the sketch that I came up with in the very beginning. Okay. Um, then, who, oops, I'll give you a name. Steven asks, can you talk about working in a studio with a Northern view? Now, how does he know that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I work exclusively with, with North Light. I mean, it's a lot of people today don't know why that's important, but in North Light Studio, you want your large light source. If you're working from natural light, you want your light to be coming from the north because particularly in the uh, Northern Hemisphere, the sunlight will never shine in your window because of, of the position of the planet in relation to the sun. So that's important because I can't have a shaft of sunlight coming in halfway through the session, striking the floor, bouncing all around the room. You want there to be even lighting in your room. So yes, that's why North Light is important to artists. And if you look in Europe, almost all artist studios were the, the big what light source would the window would face north. But I also like a skylight. I saw I have both in my current studio, large window facing north and skylights so that I can have light falling directly from above. Okay. North Light's important. Okay. Dana asks, or Dana, forgive me, I don't know which. Um, what did Anthony do before he became a painter? <laughs> I did a lot of things. Um, my, first, my first focus in my adult life was I wanted to be a policeman ever since I was a child. And that's what I did. I got hired almost right out of high school, went to police academy and was a police officer in South Florida and did that for a few years. And uh, as exciting as it was, it, it just didn't quite suit my temperament and I didn't do it for a long time. Um, then I went on to do graphic design work and that led me to do illustration work. And that led me to make paintings on my own. And that led me to um, think more about making paintings for a living. And then I also did house painting. 
to support myself before I would go to Florence. Uh, I'd come back every year in the summers and work um, doing that sort of thing. So yes, I've largely been involved with image making other than the first facet of my life as a, as a police officer. Okay. Um, w. Richards asks, when painting figures, do you consider what you do as realism or idealism? I would say realism because I'm pretty much, I pretty much am painting the model as I see them. I, I don't how, I, I wish I could make an ideal image like the way Raphael would or Titian and have an ideal in your head and use your model literally as a model, as a guide to create that image. I'm more a slave to the reality of what I see in front of me, which is a, a limitation for sure. Um, but I just don't know how to change. I could change a little thing here and there, but to change the whole nature of the figure, when it doesn't look like the model in front of me, I don't have a sense of how well I've done. How well did I paint it? And it's important to me to make a believable rendition because I really admire craft um, in painting. I really even don't even think of myself as an artist in that sense. I feel like I'm a, a, a very skilled craftsman at what I do who happens to make my craft is making images. But the term artist in contemporary times encompasses so many things that I just feel more like a, a tradesman who uses little sticks to slide paint around on a surface and make it look like something. That's interesting, very interesting. Uh, that looks like most of the questions have been addressed. I did have another thing I did wanna ask you, however. Um, as many of you may know, we are um, a campus, we're considered a campus of the College of Central Florida. So Anthony, what would you do if you met a young emerging artist, how you were once, what would you say to them um, to encourage them to become a full-time full artist? What advice would you give them? You need talent, perseverance, and dedication. It, it depends on the nature of the type of work you wanna do. I can only speak to the nature of what I do and it requires a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of discipline and focus and you need a good teacher. Um, you have to really focus on drawing skills and you want the best teacher you can get. And you should only really be leaning towards a type of painting that suits your temperament. It's just not gonna be a good fit if you don't try and paint in a manner or learn to paint in a way that really is how your brain and personality work for making a picture. The school I went to, it was, I was a fish in water. I, I took to it and never looked back and worked really hard for a long time. I was there for five years. So you really need to find what is right for you and drill down and be relentless with it and I know it sounds like a cliche, but to not give up. I was told early on a statistic that 91% of art students never end up becoming a working artist. And that did not discourage me. That encouraged me because it made me think, okay, all I have to do is keep doing it and be, and the 91% of them are gonna fall away. You just have to keep at it. And yes, it's hard. It takes money. It takes resources. You have to have a way of making a living while you're doing it. And as I said, my training was 40 hours a week for five years. It was a full-time job. And um, perseverance and talent, I don't think there's any substitute for that and creativity and discipline and okay. money to live on. <laughs> well, marvelous. Well, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you all for coming as well. We really appreciate you. We had a fantastic turnout virtually for this. And this, uh, somebody had commented that we should do more of these. This is an ongoing series. We started this very early on, I believe it was March. We do have a YouTube playlist. If you go to the Appleton Museum of Art YouTube channel, you will see the playlist for all of the Few, the, all the former uh, artist outlooks because we do record them all. 
and um, we have more coming. So our next month, we normally do the third Thursday. However, we have spring break that falls on the third Thursday. So that's not going to work out for a lot of people. So we've actually done Christopher Still. He's a wonderful artist. He painted some of our most beloved paintings as well at the Appleton, such as and my, and my Father Before Me. A lot of people really love that piece. And we are having our chat with him on Thursday, March 25th at 7 p.m. So we'll be with Christopher still at that time. So I just wanted to say thank you all very much. We very much appreciate you coming to these. They're great fun for us. So it's very gratifying to know that other people are enjoying them as well. Anthony, did you wanna say anything before we sign off? I am very grateful. I appreciate this very much. And I'm very pleased and flattered to have this platform and that to have an interest shown in my work and to get to connect with you and people and anybody who's listening. And I hope it was of some value to everybody who watched in some way. So yes, thank you. It's a, it's a real honor. I'm pleased to have done this. Oh, uh, we're, we're getting hearts and all kinds of things. So I think everybody absolutely loved it. So thank you again, Anthony. Thank you all so much for coming and we will see you again on March the 25th. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.